Welcome to session four. The topic for session four is power. We've covered the whole issue of prayer. The three P's are prayer, power, and proclamation. The question that was asked right at the beginning of the series was, why is there a lack of passion <clears throat> and power? And the first issue was that of mindset. I made the point that we, we need to change the way we look at things. I also made the point that we're living in an inverse kingdom. And so the kingdom of God is the right way up, but the kingdom of man is upside down. And we've been brought into the kingdom of man. We have inverted spiritual spectacles on, so to speak. So we see things the wrong way up, and we need to change our mindset and understand that the things of the kingdom are fundamentally different from the things of the kingdom of man. I also made the point that we need to understand that we are sons and daughters born to serve. And for me, that's almost like a, th a vocal theme that I want to keep on speaking out over and over and over again. We are sons and daughters born to serve. And if we can understand that, I truly believe we'll have a totally different approach to prayer. We'll have a different approach to ministry. We'll have a different approach to evangelism. We'll have a different approach to stewardship. If we realize that we are the ones who inherit the kingdom, that we invest ourselves in something which is of infinite value and which is permanent. And that like Jesus, because we know who we are, it will be our joy to serve. We looked lastly at the nature and purpose of prayer, and I made the point that we need to start praying from a different perspective. You see, again, I think somebody who understands that they're a son or a daughter will pray very differently. A slave says, Lord, give me instructions. Lord, don't be harsh on me. Lord, give me my wages. A son or a daughter prays and says, Father, what can I do that will please you? What, how, how can I exercise my authority and privilege in this world as your son or as your daughter? Now we move from the subject of prayer to power. And I've made the point already that there is no power in prayer. And I think by now you'll understand what I mean by that. It's not that there is no power. God is the source of power. But prayer is intimate communion with God. There cannot be any release of power in intimate communion. In fact, it, it, it's a contradiction. But because we come to God who is the source of power, He makes power available to us. So therefore, prayer precedes power. There's a scripture, however, in James 5 verse 16, which is often quoted to contradict what I've just said. Because in the NIV translation, it says, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Now, how does that then gel with the statement I've just made? There is no power in prayer, yet he has a scripture which seems to say the opposite. Let me give it to you in the Amplified Bible version. It says there, the earnest that is heartfelt and continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available. And that's what it really means. You see, when a righteous man or woman comes to God and prays and asks, God makes available to that person the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. There's huge power available for those who come with clean hearts and hands and minds before the Father and saying, Father, I want to do your will. Please empower me. He makes immense power available. In Ephesians 1 verses 15 to 23, one little extract from that says, that you may know his incomparably great power for us. And that for is also translated as in and through. His incomparably great power for, in, and through us who believe. It continues, that power is like the working of his mighty strength, 
which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him in high heavenly places. Now just pause and think about this for a moment. The scriptures talk about an incomparably great power and then give us an example of what that incomparably great power can achieve. Have you ever thought of what it must have taken to raise Jesus from the dead? You know the grave clothes were still lying there, right? You know that he had been partially embalmed. You understand that? They had, they had packed all the ointments and spices around him. They had wrapped him in the first stages of the embalming process. And then something happened which actually took that mortal body and translated it into a body that could pass right through those embalming cloths, right through them, because they just collapsed. They just were lying exactly where he was. And from that moment on, Jesus in his physicality was very different. Very different. He seemed to be able to move from one place to another with, over vast differences in an instant. They were gathered together behind locked doors for fear of the Jews, says the scripture. And Jesus suddenly appeared in their midst. He was totally different. What kind of power did it take to do that? Yet the scriptures say that same power is available to, in, and through those who believe. Before we get any further down into this discussion, I want to make the distinction between the Holy Spirit and the anointing power of the Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert. He's full of something, but he's led by someone. And there's a distinction. Now, there's a, a, <clears throat> an error of thinking in either or terms here. Jehovah's Witnesses, for instance, say that there is no God, the Holy Spirit. There's just one God, Jehovah, and that the Holy Spirit is just a euphemism for power, that it's describing the power which God gives. There's a whole group of uh, other folk, I call them the cessationists, who say, God, the Holy Spirit exists, but there is no power. There's just no power. Now, both of those, I believe, are, are fundamental errors. The scripture talks often about the person of the Holy Spirit. And, and this scripture is quite clear. Here's Jesus, God the Son, and he is full of something which is described here as the Holy Spirit. He's full of power, anointing. He's full of energy, full of. It's inside him. But he's then led by the person of the Holy Spirit. And then the picture is very graphic. It's a picture of someone filled with something being led by the person, by the hand, so to speak. We must avoid the either or errors. I've been in church meetings uh, in my young Christian days, in very big church meetings where the preachers have said things like, just plug into the power that's available for you, as if, as if the Holy Spirit is just some impersonal power source. It's not true. We can't plug into him. He is the third personage of the Godhead. He thinks, speaks, acts, decides, feels. He makes power available. He generates and gives power. So we don't plug into him. We come to him and we ask him. And when we ask, he fills us with the anointing power which he generates. There's a person who gives power. It's not a plug in the, in the spiritual wall that we can just plug into and switch on. It's a person we come to and petition. Yet the energy that he gives, the spiritual power that he gives, is very, very real. I want to talk briefly about um, a little bit of science. I'm not a scientist, so I have the ability to speak very inaccurately about scientific matters. So uh, forgive me if you've got any genuine scientists or anybody a genuine scientist watching this. But the way I understand it is that there are four fundamental forces in the universe that they've identified. There's gravity, 
There's the electromagnetic force, and there's the strong nuclear force, and there's the weak nuclear force. And they combine those, and they've been seeking for oh, at least 30 years to find what they call the grand unification theory, the gut theory, grand unification theory. Some theory which will allow scientists to take those four forces that they've identified and put them together as one. And they can't do it. No matter how brilliant their minds are, they can't find a way of putting those four forces together that make sense of the whole of creation. Why? I think it's because there's another force. There's a fifth that they know nothing of. There's a spiritual energy which comes from God. Now think about the scriptures like the following one. It talks about Jesus, and it says that by him and through him all things were created, and for him all things were created. And then it goes on and says, and he maintains all things. So from God issues an energy which holds all of this created universe together. There can be no grand unification theory until they acknowledge that there is another force. There is another power. And it is not gravity. It's not electromagnetics. It's the power of God which permeates and enthuses this whole created world and holds everything together. But that, that power comes from the person of the Holy Spirit. As always, I want to take you to the example of Jesus. In Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 11, it talks about the baptism of the Lord Jesus. It says, Jesus goes to John the Baptist, who is baptizing in the Jordan. And it says, while he is praying, the heavens open, something that looks like a dove, shimmering comes down and rests upon him. And the voice of the Father speaks from heaven and says, This is my dearly beloved Son, of whom I am well pleased. So Jesus starts his ministry at the age of 30. Jesus starts his ministry under the anointing power of the Holy Spirit. Something we need to realize is for, for 30 years, Jesus lives in obscurity. For 30 years, you hear very little of him. At the age of 12, we know he went to the temple. And then there's this huge gap. It just says he, was, he lived in submission to his parents. He learned the trade of a carpenter. For 30 years, he does nothing. At the age of 30, he emerges. Why at 30? Well, at 30, a Jewish man became capable of teaching. He was regarded as a fully-fledged adult. A person could become a rabbi. A man could become a rabbi at the age of 30. He emerges and he starts his ministry. But the first thing that happens to him is he is filled with power from on high. The anointing comes upon him. And we, we know that that's factual because in places like Luke 4, 14, it says he returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. So before that, he comes to the Jordan, and then he, he goes away from that experience in the power of the Spirit. In Luke chapter 4, verses 17 to 19, he announces his ministry. And how does he announce his ministry? The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, release for the captive, and recovery of sight for the blind. That's how he announces his ministry. He doesn't say, oh, I've come to tell you a few things. He says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to do the following. In Luke 5, verse 17, it talks about power being present for him to heal. And that's a fascinating statement. Because what does it imply? It implies that there were times when power was not present for him to heal. And that's interesting, isn't it? In fact, there are, are cases, the negative cases, where it talks about, and Jesus could not do many miracles in that place because of their lack of faith. There seems to be times when Jesus could do more than at other times, when the anointing was stronger upon him than at other times. In Luke 8.46, it 
it talks about Jesus feeling power leaving him. The woman with the issue of blood comes and touches his garment, and he says, who touched me? His disciples say, come on, everybody's touching you. There's a huge crowd around you. He said, uh-uh, somebody touched me with faith, so to speak. Why do I know that? For I felt power leaving me. Now think of the implications of that. That can only mean one thing. He was full of power that actually could leave him. And he was actually conscious of the sensation. He knew that this power had moved from him to somebody who had made contact with him in faith, hope, and expectation. In Luke 6 verse 19, it says that many people were gathered around him for power was coming from him to heal them. Now again, isn't that interesting? It talks about the people being conscious that there was power emanating from this man. They crowded around him because this, he, was, he was like this generator of spiritual power. This power was coming from him to heal them. So they, they gathered around him. They wanted to be close to him. They wanted to touch him. They wanted him to lay hands on, on them. For he was full of the power of the Holy Spirit. And then to clinch matters, in Luke 24, verse 49, he instructs his disciples to wait for power from on high. He starts his ministry only when he's been anointed. He announces his ministry in terms of his anointing. And then he says to his disciples, now you guys wait in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem until you receive that power from on high. But I did, so to speak. And then go out and make disciples in my name. Let's move from Jesus and let me give you the example of Peter. In Acts 3, 6, we again have a very, very interesting story. Peter and John are going into the temple area through a gate called the Gate Beautiful. And here is a man who has been placed there by his relatives every single day to beg. He's lame. He cannot stand. Now, how many times would Peter and John have, have walked past that man? Well, we know that they were meeting daily in the temple courts for prayer. So, I mean, they were past him every single day. Had Jesus gone into the temple courts? Yes, on several occasions. So Jesus himself would have walked right past this beggar because he was there every single day. His family brought him early and collected him late. On this day, these two men stop. We can ask ourselves the question, why? I mean, he would have been doing the same as he always does. He would have had his hands out. He would have been saying, shekels, shekels, give me some money. Look at my poor crippled legs. But on this day, they stopped. Why? I think, it doesn't say this, but I think it's because the Holy Spirit arrested him and said, deal with this man. You know, Jesus said, I only do what I see my Father doing. And that principle, I believe, is applies to us and it applied to the apostles. So I can only assume then that as they were coming into the temple, as, as usual, the Holy Spirit impressed upon them and said, that one. So they turn to this man and they say to him, we don't have any money. I don't have silver and I don't have gold. But now listen to what they then said. But what I have, what I have, I give you. They, they didn't say, uh, I will pray for you. They just didn't say that. They didn't say, okay, well, let's have a prayer meeting. Uh, jo John, would you mind leading in prayer? And they didn't lay hands on him and say, Heavenly Father, please won't you be merciful to this poor man, etc., etc., etc. They didn't do that. They said, and I'm paraphrasing wildly now, we have been filled with power from the Holy Spirit, and that we have. And we can give that which we have to you. We don't have money. We do have this, and it's of greater value than money. So, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Then they reached down and made physical contact with him and lifted him up. And he walked. Something happened. That which they had, they gave him, and it changed his life. Let me give you another interesting example. Acts chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. It talks about 
they brought the lame and the sick and they laid them out in the street where they knew that Peter would be coming to his Bible study meetings. Why? Because they believed that when his shadow fell over them, they got healed. Okay, so what is a shadow? A shadow is not a thing. A shadow is the lack of something. The shadow is a lack of light. Shadow is caused when, when an obstacle comes between the object and a light source. That's a shadow. There is no power in a shadow. It's a negative. It's the shadow's not healing them, so it is. Logically, there's only one answer to this. Here is a man so full of the Holy Spirit, so full of the anointing, so full of power from on high, that as he's walking, the people that he walks past get healed. He is radiating. Why is that hard to understand? It happened to Jesus, didn't it? People crowded around him because they saw and felt the power coming from him. Power was coming from him. So they clustered around him and they got healed. Peter walks from point A to point B and the people along the way get healed. I've seen many, many times examples of this. I've seen, I'll give you one example. Uh, somebody I know very, very well had a terrible and traumatic experience. I was lying in bed. The man looked 80% dead. By the time we arrived at his, uh, where he was, he was, had the sheets drawn up to his neck, white ashen faced, eyes half closed. As we came in, he just greeted us, hello. He was really in a bad state. He sat down next to his bed. There were four or five of us. We, we started talking. We weren't even doing any praying at that stage. We were just talking. And we were talking to him. And his head came up. And then he moved up a little bit in his bed. And then he propped a pillow and he sat up in his bed. And we just went on talking. And, and then he pulled the sheets down and he swung his legs off. And then he got out of bed. And then he started getting dressed. And he wasn't even aware of what was happening. And when he was fully dressed, he sat on the edge of the bed and then we all looked at each other. And we said, praise God. You're a lot better, aren't you? <laughs> he said, yes, I am. <laughs> and we all went from there. We went and had a meal. It was the most phenomenal thing I've ever experienced. Why? What was happening? I can only understand it in terms of the fact that a whole bunch of people who were filled with the Spirit of God were gathered around him. And he was receiving John Wimber tells a, a, a lovely, gentle little story about how he had been preaching at a five-day conference and he was standing at the airport waiting for them to call his flight. And he was really feeling anointed. I mean, he'd been in the presence of God for five days and he was standing, he's quite a big, he was quite a big chap and he, he describes how he was standing there with his arms folded thus. And, and a lady was standing over there and he watched her, she gradually eased closer until she was standing right up next to him. And he didn't know from a bar of soap. And he looked down and he said, it's nice standing there, isn't it? <laughs> and she said, yes. I don't know what it is, but I just feel so good. <laughs> and he said, what do you think that was? It can only have been the anointing power of the Holy Spirit that was emanating from him. And she didn't understand it. She just received from it. 